If you found your identity in Christ, maybe you got saved as a young person or a few years ago or 30 years ago, and God's increased you, and you know you give him the glory, he's increased you, and you've had a chance to make an impact for God on a few people or a lot of people, and God has given you influence in the kingdom, But if you've made a mistake, either 10 years ago, or last month, or last week, or yesterday, and if you've even made it, tried to make it worse by trying to, trying to make it better, but you made it worse, all you have to do is repent. We are finishing a four part series uh, called What's My Purpose? And so this will be the last message. And I just want to remind you how this series even started in my heart this past summer. Uh, God reminded me that when I turned 60, he gave me a word. And he said, you're entering a new season of your life, and it's a season of influence. And then he reminded me that when we started the church, the Lord showed me four generations Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph in 20-year increments and said, I want Gateway to be a church that ministers to all generations. So I thought, okay, if 60 and over, if the word is influence, is there a, a, a word for uh, the Isaac generation, 40 to 60? And I felt like the Lord gave me the word impact. And so I shared last week on impact. And then I thought, well, what about 20 to 40? And I felt like it was increase. You know, you're getting out of college, beginning a new career, beginning a family or whatever. And then I was sharing with the elders on the elders retreat. And I was sharing, and I said, I'm going to begin this series, and I, uh, but I don't have a word yet for under 20, and I know God's going to give me one. And Dr. Carrasco, one of our elders uh, who's a surgeon, came up to me at a break and said, hey, this word came to my mind when you said that, and it's the word identity. And when he said it, I thought, man, that's exactly if you remember that message, hopefully you got to hear it, we talked about how Satan is trying to steal or even confuse the identity of our children and students. And so I've done identity, I've done increase, I've done impact, so this week obviously the title of the message is Influence, all right? Um, I, I, I have to tell you that this message took a turn uh, when I was preparing and so I was sharing it with Debbie, kind of going over my burden for the message and where I was going to share. We got about halfway through the mess, me, me sharing with her, and she said, so how does this relate to influence? <laughs> and so you might think that, okay? But if you'll stay with me, uh, I'm going somewhere, all right? So uh, we're talking about David. We've been using the life of David, that he wrote Psalms when he was a teenager, that he defeated Goliath as a teenager, and how God increased him then, and then how he had great impact for the kingdom. We talked about that last week. So uh, even if you found your identity in Christ, uh, even if you've increased, even if you've made an impact for God, and even if you have influence in the kingdom, like David did, there's one thing about David we haven't talked about, and everyone knows about it, and that is his fall with Bathsheba. So, here's what I'm going to do on my, for my first point. Even if you have already found your identity in Christ, you've done all these things, here's number one, you might make a mistake. Could be a small one, could be a medium-sized one, could be a great big one like David. So 2 Samuel 11, verse 1, it happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle. Notice David should have been going out to battle. That David sent, in other words, he didn't go himself, Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. In other words, he stayed at home. And then it happened one evening that David rose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. I had a 
friend of mine, pastor friend that preached the message on the balcony with binoculars. But anyway. <laughs> Verse three, so David sent and inquired about the woman. This is a very important part of the story that you might not have ever known about. And someone said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, or Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? So this is whose daughter it is. This is whose wife it is. We'll come back to that. Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him. Took simply means brought her to his home. And he lay with her. For, and another version says, when she was cleansed from her impurity. And we'll talk about that. And she returned to her house, and the woman conceived. So she sent and told David and said, I am with child. Okay. So the daughter of Eliam, um, you need to know something. Uh, he was one of David's 30 mighty men. And the wife of Uriah, Uriah was one of David's 30 men. And then just so you know, Bathsheba's grandfather was Ahithophel, which was, according to the Bible, David's most trusted counselor. So David knew her grandfather, her father, and her husband. I'll come back to that in a moment. I want to explain to you just for a moment about David's mighty men because a lot of people say, well, were there 30 or were there three? Yes. Um, but there were actually 37. <laughs> so it's in 2 Samuel 23 and it goes through the list. First of all, there was a chief of his mighty men and it says he killed 800 men at one time. He's a pretty bad dude, okay? And this was obviously war, so this was soldiers, okay? Um, then it says there were three mighty men, and of those mighty men, those three, one of them killed 300 men at one time, and it says, and he killed a lion in a pit on a snowy day. Just giving you, it's amazing how detailed the Bible is, all right? So there, there was one who was chief, and then there were three, which we normally call the three mighty men, David's mighty men. So that's four, but then there were three more. And it says those three were mighty, but never attained to the, to the other three. So now there are seven. Everyone got that? And then there were 30 mighty men, so there were 37 in all. And just to show you the very last verse in 2 Samuel 23, Verse 39 says, and Uriah the Hittite, 37 in all. So it's just kind of show, it's listing the names. You can go and read it sometime about the chief that killed 800, the three, and one of them killed three and killed a lion in a pit on a snowy day. Um, and then the other three that never attained to the three and then the 30. But uh, Eliam, her father, Bathsheba's father, and Uriah, her husband, were part of David's mighty men. And Ahithophel, her grandfather, was David's most trusted counselor. Here's what I want you to say. It's very possible, most theologians believe this, that he'd seen Bathsheba before. That he knew her. Because he knew her grandfather. You don't think her grandfather carried pictures of her in his wallet? <laughs> I mean, if not, he was not a true grandfather. And pulled him up pulled him out every chance he got, right? Okay. And he knew her father, and he knew her husband. And these were men who fought with him, and Ahithophel stayed with him all the time he was running from Saul and was like a secret spy for him. I'm just simply saying, did he see her at some point and think to himself, Wow, she's a knockout. And did he let that thought ruminate in him? Then he calls her to his house. But there's something here, and by, by the way, let me, let me go ahead and just 
spill the beans on something. Um, when, well, let me say it this way. How old was David when he fell with Bathsheba? You wouldn't believe how many pastors will say 30. And I don't know why they pull that number, but they just do. But actually he was 60. 60. And remember that you, the Lord was showing me these age groups, although we go through these four seasons all through our lives, but I do believe they can be overall age groups as well. He's entering a season of influence and immediately Satan tries to steal his influence. And he'd seen, I believe he'd seen this beautiful woman before, but obviously just her face. But now he sees her naked. Um, let me, let me uh, say something about this. Why would this great man of God who wrote all these worship songs go to such an extent and fall? There's something in men that can take over if they don't keep it in check. And that is lust. Um, you know that I love the country and we have some land in the country where you know where I was helicoptered from a few years ago. Josh and I were out there one time uh, walking around and all of a sudden two does, two deer, female deer, run like literally right by us and almost knock us over. That doesn't happen. I mean, they smell a human, they're out of there. So we actually just squatted down thinking, wow, what's happening? And then a buck comes right behind us. And we watched this buck chase these two does for about 10 minutes until he caught one. And uh, I'm thinking of a good way to say this. <laughs> Let me just say we saw him a few minutes later with a cigarette in his mouth, okay? <laughs> but we were about 15 yards away when he did it in front of us, 15 yards from humans, okay? Here's the point. He wasn't thinking that there could be danger because something else had taken control of him. If you, if, if you are a hunter, you know the best time to kill a big buck is during the rut, it's called the rut. There are two ruts, one in November, and then 30 days later, if the doe isn't bred, she goes back in the rut, and the, she puts off a scent that attracts uh, a buck. And hunters know this is the time to kill a big buck because he's not thinking clearly. He doesn't have his warnings up. Can I just say something? Satan knows when to kill a strong man. He knows when you're not thinking clearly. And he knew David wasn't thinking clearly and he moved in, all right? Now, let me go a little deeper into this sin. It says, when the days of her impurity were cleansed. She's on the, on the roof bathing. There was a reason that she was on the roof bathing because it was the end of her menstrual cycle. Uh, ladies didn't have the protection that they have now during their menstrual cycle. And so that that cleansing, that bathing was normally done on the seventh day, the last day of their cycle. And so it's a, it's a very thorough cleansing then. But, and that's when he saw her and brought her to his home. But according to law, he had to wait, which is, was God's law. I'm gonna show it to you in a minute in Leviticus. I'll just read it to you. Leviticus 15, 28. But if she is cleansed of her discharge, then she shall count for herself seven days and after that, she shall be clean. In other words, her husband can't go into her um, until after that time. So here's what you may have never heard about this story. 
He brings her to the castle, but she says, but I, I'm not clean yet. And he had to wait seven days. This was premeditated. Seven days, God gave him the opportunity to change his mind. And by the way, it was actually eight days because on the eighth day before she could have sex, she had to go to the temple and offer an offering of two turtle doves and a partridge in a pear tree. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> but two turtle doves. But here's what gets me about this when I read it, and, and I'm not putting David down, but he has sex with her when she comes back from church. He literally waits for her to go to church and come back. I mean, he's intent on doing this sin. And it takes two to tangle. And you, you, you might think, well, yeah, but he was the king. And some people think the word took her, when it says David took her, that he, that he raped her. That's not the word here. But the Bible, when, a, when a woman was raped in the Bible, it's very clear that he forced her. David did not force her. And the other thing was the Jewish law said that no Jewish citizen had to obey the king if the king was disobeying God's laws. I'm not trying to put Bathsheba down. I'm simply saying she could have refused him. And she would have been protected by law. Now, David might have been in such a place where he would have had something done to her. We don't know. Or he might have been in such a place he would have had something done to her husband, which he did anyway. But was there something in her that liked David? Remember what the Bible tells us about David? He was a good-looking man. Much like myself, I would assume. <laughs> um, but he was a good-looking man. He was king, he was wealthy, he was powerful. When she got called to the palace, she didn't know why she was being called, but she probably figured it out pretty quickly. But she didn't stop it either. All, all I'm saying is that the enemy is very crafty. You better watch out for it. Even a man who served God made a huge mistake. Even a man who wrote part of the Bible made a huge mistake. Um, by the way, about this time, the message, Debbie said, it seems like David's using his influence the wrong way. I said, yeah, you're right. You're picking up on where I'm going. Here's, uh, so number one is you might make a mistake. Here's number two. You might make it worse. Now, I'm probably the only one here who's ever made a mistake and then made it worse. But I'll bet I'm not. <laughs> I bet some of you say, yeah, I'm there too. I made a mistake and I made it worse too. Um, so let me read you how he made it worse. 2 Samuel 11, verse 6. Then David sent to Joab, that's the commander of the army, saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah had come to him, David asked how Joab was doing, how the people were doing, and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, go down to your house. Of course, everyone knows what he's doing because his wife's pregnant. He wants it to look like Uriah came in from the war and got her pregnant. Go down to your house and wash your feet. And he figures when he gets there, he's going to see this woman, his wife, and, you know, you know we know what's going to happen then. So Uriah departed from the king's house, and a gift of food from the king followed him. David's setting it up, setting up a romantic evening. Probably had some candles in there, too. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. So when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, did you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants uh, of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink, watch, and to lie with my wife? 
as you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. So now David knows he's dealing with a man of character. So he's, he's intent on trying to cover his sin. Then David said to Uriah, wait here today also and tomorrow, and then I will let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And when David called him, he ate and drank before him. Watch this. And he made him drunk. So David gets him drunk, thinking he'll lose his morals now. He'll lose his sense of character and integrity, and he'll remember he's got a really pretty wife at home. And in evening, he went out to lie on his bed, this is Uriah, with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. So now David's going to make it worse. In the morning, it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah, and he wrote in the letter saying, set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him, that he may be struck down and die. He ordered his execution. Murder. He commits murder. And then in verse 26, when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, that's 30 days. That was the typical time of mourning for a husband. Please mourn just, Debbie, just a little longer than a month. <clears throat> and then don't have a big party and all. So David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Now, I really need to hit this. The word displeased, I love words. And I love to look them up in the original language. In the Hebrew, this is two words. The first word is shattered. The thing that David did shattered the Lord. It broke his heart. The second word is kind of strange, but it means evil. Uh, some versions actually read, it displeased the Lord because it was evil. It displeased the Lord because what he did was evil. Let me say it another way. He did something evil and it broke God's heart. It didn't break God's heart because God's a prude or anything like that. It broke his heart because he knew his son had fallen and he was going to have to now pay the consequences for his fall. I'm just telling you, if you've made a mistake, it doesn't make God mad. It breaks his heart. Because he knows that you're now going to go through some consequences. Please hear me. Jesus took all the punishment for all the sin in the world, past, present, and future, even sins of the saints in the Old Testament, even sins of the people who weren't saints. They just had to believe in God. He took the sin of the whole world on him. He took your punishment. So if you have fallen, God is not punishing you. You're just bearing the consequences of your sin. But God's not getting you back because he already got his son back for your sin. Uh, let me give you an illustration. If you jump off of a building, when you hit the ground, God's not getting you back but you're bearing the consequences of your actions. So you need to know that. So what if you have your identity in Christ, God's even increased you in wisdom and understanding, you've gotten to know the Bible a little better, you're in a group, you're going to equip classes, and now you're actually impacting some people, you've led some people to Christ, you might even be leading a group, and he's giving you influence, and then you make a big mistake. And then you actually make it worse. What do you do? Well, here's point number three. You can still repent. If you can fog a mirror, it's not too late to repent. But once you stop breathing, you can't repent anymore. But you can still repent. 2 Samuel 12, verse 1, next chapter. So the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to tell David this story. 
there were two men in a certain town. One was rich and one was poor. The rich man owned a great many sheep and cattle. The poor man owned nothing but one little lamb he had bought. He raised that little lamb and it grew up with his fat children. It ate from the man's own plate and drank from his cup. He cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. One day a guest arrived at the home of the rich man, but instead of killing an animal from his own flock or herd, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and prepared it for his guest. David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man who would do, do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole and for having no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are that man. The Lord, the God of Israel says, now he's, he's prophesying now what a God specifically said. I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. Remember Saul chased him for five years. I gave you your master's house and his wives and the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. Now watch this statement. It's one of the most incredible statements in the Bible. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you much, much more. Boy, if you're ever thinking about committing sin, I want you to remember that verse. God, God is saying, look what I've already done for you. And then he makes this statement. And if that's not enough, I'll give you more. So that you don't do something that could possibly ruin your life and hurt your family. I'll give you more if it'll keep you in the straight and narrow. Now, many people don't know this, but David spoke his own consequences. Uh, <laughs> he said he'll repay fourfold. Four of David's sons died. The baby that he and Bathsheba conceived, this was not Solomon, that was after. That baby died after seven days. We talked about last week, and then he went to the temple, the house of God, and worshiped. And then his son Amnon, and then Absalom, and then um, Adonijah. By the way, all three of them were murdered. Now, please understand, you say, I thought you said God wasn't getting him back. He wasn't getting him back because all three of them did something worthy of death. And the little baby, God just took him to heaven. He was just seven days old. And by the way, we remember David said, I shall go to him and he shall not return to me. David lived 10,000 years before the time of Christ, been 2,000 years since then. So David and Bathsheba have been living with that son for 3,000 years so far. But Amnon did something worthy of death. Absalom did, and so did Adonijah. They all paid. So what I'm simply saying is God knew the future. And he just allowed David to speak his own judgment. But then, you will see God's grace. David and Bathsheba have another son who becomes the wisest man who's ever lived on the face of the earth. That's what the Bible tells us. It's the wisest man to ever live. Now, I just want you to notice, I didn't say smartest. <laughs> Here's why I say that. They, uh, Solomon made some mistakes too. But the other thing is, I met some smart people, and some of them say there is no God. That's not wise. But Solomon was wise. And then we know David knew he was forgiven because you ever heard the scripture that God removes our sins as far as the east is from the west? Uh, that scripture is in Psalm. Try to remember who wrote Psalms. Psalm 103, verse 12. But I want you to notice how David writes this. He has removed our sins as far from us, from us as the east is from the west. David didn't say he has removed your sins, you dirty, rotten sinners, from you. He says he's removed our sins. 
from us as far as the east is from the west. We were talking in the green room before and Pastor Tommy Briggs reminded me of something I'd heard years ago, but I'd forgotten it. He said, it's, God said he's removed our sins as far as the east is from the west because if you go east, you can just keep going east and keep going east and keep going east and keep going east and never get to the end. It's infinity. But he didn't say as far as the north is from the south because you can get to the north pole and you can get to the south pole and it's, you're at the end. So there's no end to how far God has removed your sins from you. <laughs> By the way, Solomon's in the lineage of Jesus. And his parents were David and Bathsheba. But it, I don't have time to do it, but you look at the lineage of Jesus, there's a whole bunch of people that made mistakes. Rahab the harlot is in the lineage of Jesus. It's amazing, the Bible, every time it says Rahab, it says Rahab the harlot, Rahab the harlot. I think I would say, look, could you just say something else? The former harlot, the, the, the artist formerly known as harlot. <laughs> and then there are some others, but I don't have time to go into them. David repented. Now remember that the name of this series is What's My Purpose? So you're saying, well, Pastor Robert, how do I know my purpose? Okay, it's very simple. You first have to get your identity in Christ. You have to be faithful when he increases you. You have to make an impact for God on this earth, and you have to use your influence for the kingdom. And when you do that, your purpose will be evident. That's what I'm telling you. I know exactly what my purpose is, because as I've done this formula, it's, it's just evident what my purpose is. It is not to dance in the equip video. <laughs> it's to teach people the Bible. But I have a real burden for people who've blown it. I just want you to know you can still have influence for God even if you've blown it. Because how does the New Testament refer to this adulterer and murderer. Acts 13 is a message Paul brought, and he's kind of going through some Old Testament saints. And I'm going to show you 36 and then back up to 22. But Acts 13 verse 36 says, Now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. That sums up the whole series right there. I'm saying, what's your purpose? I started to name it discovering your purpose. Okay, but what it says is he served God's purpose. Here's the key. You don't need to find your purpose. You need to find God's purpose for your life. And then you need to serve God in your generation. And then verse 22, watch this, says, after removing Saul, he, that's God, made David their king. Then watch, watch what God says about this man who was an adulterer and a murderer. God testified concerning him. Testified, like in court. So he's got to tell the truth. Of course, God's going to tell the truth all the time anyway. He says, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. And then he makes this statement. You have to really be, uh, really be clear on what he's saying here. He will do everything I want him to do. And they're quoting, by the way, a man after God's own heart. That's in 1 Samuel 13. Okay, that, that's a scripture it's quoting in the New Testament from the Old, where God says, I found a man after my own heart. Okay, but it says he will do everything I want him to do. And what I think it should add to that is, and some things that I don't want him to do. <laughs> Have you ever, you ever seen a commercial um, that has small print at the bottom, you know? And there's this guy who says, I used to have skin problems, and I was just afraid to even go outside. And then I put this new medicine on it, and look at my skin. Of course, you got tattooed on you know, look at my skin, you know? Okay, and then down at the bottom, it says, paid actor. <laughs> He's never used that medicine in his life. That small print always gets you, okay. So I kind of wondered, well, what would the small print be 
after this verse that says he will do everything that I want him to do. I think it might read something like this. And because he's human, he will make some stu huge, stupid mistakes. <laughs> and the Bible, I know, doesn't have small print, but it kind of does because have you noticed that the Bible doesn't leave these things out? It tells us that he committed adultery. And then he committed murder trying to cover it up. But if you want to know if he still has influence, he still has influence to this day. Because everyone knows who the greatest king of Israel ever was. And people read and sing his songs. And last week we saw speaking under the inspiration of the Spirit. He wrote part of the Bible that people are still reading to this day. So he still had influence. So here's my burden. If you found your identity in Christ, maybe you got saved as a young person or a few years ago or 30 years ago, and God's increased you, and you know you give him the glory, he's increased you, and you've had a chance to make an impact for God on a few people or a lot of people, and God has given you influence in the kingdom But if you've made a mistake, either 10 years ago, or last month, or last week, or yesterday, and if you've even made it, tried to make it worse by trying to, trying to make it better, but you made it worse, all you have to do is repent. And I'm gonna give you a chance at every campus and everyone online to repent right now. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I'd, I'd really like for you to just keep your eyes closed at, at every campus everywhere. Because I want you to just have a moment alone with God. And I'm gonna be the only one looking around, but I'm just wondering how many of you would say, Pastor Robert, I know God, God's even blessed me and done some things in my life that are incredible. But this message was for me because I made a mistake and it's hard for me to get over it. Would you just, and it might not be a adultery. No, please don't think of that. I'm not asking for that. Just, it could be a big mistake, a medium size, or just a small mistake, but Satan's beating you up about it. Would you just, if you say, that's me, I've made a mistake, would you just put your hand up way high and I need to repent. I need to repent before God. Look, it's amazing. I say 50%. It's incredible how many hands have gone up. I knew God. I knew when God gave me the message, he was going to speak. You think you can put your hands down. Would you just right now tell God, I, I repent. I change my mind. That's what the word means. I change my mind about that sin, about continuing in that sin, and even the way I think about that sin. I'm not going to let Satan beat me up anymore. I'm going to believe that God has removed my sins as far as the east is from the west. But I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. I'm going to ask you at every campus, every campus, okay, it may, you may think that's a little different because I know you're seeing me on a screen, but this is very, very important. In just a moment, we're gonna have people at the front. It's our altar ministry team. And I would like to say to you, we need everybody we can get to pray with people because we're gonna have a lot of people to pray with. So maybe this isn't even your week to serve on the altar ministry team, but I'd love to see the altar ministry team go all the way across the front of every campus and maybe even down the sides of the aisles. So that's great with me. So if you're on altar ministry team and you've got a few minutes and you can pray with some people, and here's the reason I'm asking, this is going to shock you. I'm asking everyone that raised their hands to come and pray with someone. Here's why. You don't even have to tell them the mistake. You told God. So you don't have to tell them. But the Bible says that when we do that act of confession with another person, of, of saying, I've made a mistake, it says it this way, confess your faults to one another 
that you may be healed. And you need to be healed, some physically, some emotionally, some spiritually, some mentally of this mistake. It's been holding you back long enough. So in just a moment, we're gonna have some worship and we're gonna stand, all of us. And when we all stand, here's what I want you to do. If you raised your hand or even if you didn't, but God's speaking to you, I want you to stand up and just step out and come all in, in one moment, all right? And if you're on our ministry team, when I start praying, you can go ahead and start coming so you'll be already be down here and be ready to minister to people, all right? And there are gonna be a lot of people, so uh, maybe if it's a, just a quick prayer of agreement, that may be all it takes. And if it takes longer, that's great too. But whatever it is, please, God put this message in my heart. It's, it's one of the most important messages I think I've ever preached because I know that God told me a whole lot of people are being held back by this mistake. And David made a huge mistake and then a bigger mistake than that. And yet he received my forgiveness. He repented and I forgave him. So if you put your hand up, as I'm gonna pray. When I say amen, I want you to stand up, everyone, everyone. And when we stand, as soon as you stand up, if you need to come, I want you to come. Listen, it's gonna take humility on your part because people might think, well, he preached on you know, some pretty bad sins and I don't want people to think, forget about what people think. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about if it was adultery. And maybe it was, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about whatever that mistake was that caused you to put your hand up. Let's nail it to the cross today so it doesn't hold you back anymore. So you decide right now, every campus, all right? Lord, I just pray for my brothers and sisters and I've been in their shoes. I can say as David, you say you have separated our sins as far as the east is from the west from us. So I pray for all of them who said, that's me. I pray you'll give them courage now to come and agree with someone in prayer so we nail that thing to the cross today. In Jesus' name, amen. So stand up, and as soon as you stand up, just step out and come, okay? Don't wait to see if someone else is gonna come. Just step out and come. Come on, don't, don't wait. Don't wait, don't let the Satan get the victory. If you say, that's me, and I need to pray with someone, come on, come on, just step out and come. At every campus, every campus, no matter which campus you're attending, just step out and come. Just step out and come, all right? And at every campus, we'll have people at the front to pray with you. So if you need to come, when you get down here, look to the left or the right and find someone that's available and go up to them. If no one's available, please hear me. I'm so proud of you for coming, but just wait. Just wait, just, it'll take maybe a minute, maybe five minutes, maybe 30 seconds, but just wait. And don't let the devil talk you into going back to your seat, all right? If you need to come, that you're nailing something down today that has needed to be nailed down for years. So every campus, I'm gonna turn it back to the camp, our campus uh, campuses in just a minute, but I would just like to say something. You, you keep coming if you need to come, but I'd just like to say something to everyone in the congregation. Can we just thank God, because we've been in every one of these shoes before. Let's thank the Lord. Hey everyone, I'm Pastor Robert, and thank you so much for watching my YouTube channel. Be sure to share what God is teaching you in the comments below so that it might encourage others. And click the subscribe button and then tap the bell icon so that you'll be notified every time a new video is posted. And don't forget, you can watch full episodes anytime right here on my YouTube channel. Thanks again for watching.